The Disney Renaissance. It's a nomenclature which represented the almost yearly released motion pictures from the early to late 90s which were produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios. These films were not only incredibly well received, but also restored the creative enthusiasm and energy which Disney is now and always revered for. Their definition were one to only be described as, well, a renaissance. And if you're anything like me, your VHS copies of them were well and proudly worn out, many even revered today as some of the best adaptations of tales as old as time. Which leads us to Disney and their recent trend of adapting their classic animated films into live action spectacles, with digital effects reflecting style and magic of their animated counterparts. The most recent of these adaptations is Beauty and the Beast, headlining actors such as Emma Watson from Harry Potter, Dan Stevens of Downton Abbey fame, and Josh Gad of Actually Can Sing, unlike the other two people I mentioned fame. Beauty and the Beast, like many of Disney's animations, is a variation of an astonishingly ancient story, which is just another way to say a tale as old as time, but I didn't want to do that same joke twice. While the story's origins have been around for almost 4,000 years, Beauty and the Beast, or La Belle et la Bête, I absolutely destroyed that pronunciation, by the way, was first published by a French novelist named Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve. It was later retold, rewritten, and republished on a variety of children's books, playwrights, and even television specials. With such a loose definition of the story, there ended up to be quite a few bizarre incarnations of the fairy tale, one of which was a CBS detective show featuring Ron Perlman as the beast living in the sewers of New York. This leads us to the Disney animated film, finally, in which an otherwise beautiful young lady falls into circumstances which end her up in the clutches of a bitter beast once human, which has been trapped in a castle for 10 years, leading to, spoiler alert, the two falling in love and breaking the spell. Now, that's the story on a surface level. However, like many individuals on the internet, people have to make it much more than what it actually is. Like a disgruntled high school teacher teaching to kill a mockingbird. It's just about racism. What I don't agree with is the fact that many are relating the attitude of Belle to an otherwise mentally ill individual experiencing Stockholm Syndrome. It's these people who say that Totoro in the Ghibli classic is a Shinigami, or God of Death. When there's something child-friendly or heavily revered, there's going to be individuals that attempt to contextualize it as something which is much more sinister. However, many of their claims come off as baseless, lacking any critical thinking, and completely miss the point entirely of the source material. Now don't get me wrong, Beauty and the Beast is a story with a lot of nuance to be discussed. To take for example one small addition in the live-action adaptation, as Belle is conversing with numerous individuals in her village. There's very few people who hold her up in any way that sees her as an otherwise odd individual. One character who doesn't attribute themselves to the dismay of Belle is a man who is asked by Belle if he has forgotten or misplaced anything. There's a prolonged sequence where internally he struggles to remember if he has indeed forgotten where something is, and he ultimately comes to the conclusion that his mind has lapsed and he has indeed lost something he just doesn't remember what it is. It's later revealed that this was foreshadowing, as he was the husband of Mrs. Potts and the father of Chip, which is ironic considering he was the one selling porcelain dishware at the village. He's a character which is experiencing what the entire theme of the story of Beauty and the Beast is. Loss. Practically every character in this film has experience with this loss, whether it's the villagers who have lost their memories of a regency long gone, Belle who lost her mother at a young age, a loss which is shared with her father, or Gaston who is consistently feeling of a man with the loss of an empowered ego. It's just a component to its characters and message that each character has loss and deals with it in a different way. Another important component regarding the composition of the characters lies also within how Belle and her father deal with their loss. In the village, practically every individual has a consequential part which creates an environment of functionality. You have bakers, cooks, people who are making sure the village runs, while Belle is reading books and her father is a painter. 
It's no wonder why they're considered outcasts or crazy people, as they're expressionistic and have their own deepened sense of individuality that the others can't relate to. This finally leads us to an analyzation of the Beast. This is something which was merely hinted at in the original animated feature, but expounded upon in this live-action adaptation, that reading and expressionism is what makes individuals empathetic. I will support people's opinion that the Beast is mentally ill. It would be bizarre if he wasn't, since he's been locked up in a castle for 10 years with only furniture to talk to, we presume. He probably has bad self-esteem because of his appearance, and it's evident he has social anxiety on his account of 10 years in isolationism. At first, he doesn't even want to speak to Belle, as he is too depressed and cynical having no confidence in his own likability or charm. We might see Beast struggle with being the Beast at the very beginning of the film, but he most definitely has come to terms with his fate when we see him later in the film. Contrasting this are the living furnishings in the castle which represent the Beast's conscience. They're the small and dying voice that still hopes of being free from the spell of the sorceress and the imprisonment of the Beast's self-pitying mind. While the Beast has long ago stopped listening to these voices, it comes with the arrival of Belle, the first presence of a human being he has encountered in 10 years. These voices start to borderline shout to him, pushing him to remember his forgotten rules of courtesy, social discipline, and of course, mannerisms. And it's through this effort that Belle realizes there is humanity in the Beast, and the Beast starts to overcome his inherent lack of self-esteem. The major turning point in this relationship comes within a tiny change. It's when Belle uncovers the Beast's love for books. The Beast is able to understand Belle once he shows her his library room. Another great addition to the film, as in the animated feature, she hadn't been squandered in any way by books, while she had read from almost the same small shelf of books all her life in the live-action adaptation. The Beast and Belle find a common interest, and it's the thing that connects them. The Beast even cracks a joke the first time they're in the library, melting his otherwise coarse exterior he had before. It's character interactions such as the moment when Beast asks what Belle's favorite book is, and she replies that Romeo and Juliet is her favorite, that solidify this addition to the story as intentional and of course meaningful. Plus, the reaction where he rolls his eyes to her response is priceless, and it connects him not only with her, but with us as the viewer. Research has proven that reading makes us more empathetic. Literary fiction in particular can help us read emotional cues and are primary when contextualizing people's motives. This in turn can make us more understanding human beings, which can greatly enhance our personal relationships. It doesn't just expand our view on the world, it expands our hearts. Thus, as Belle and the Beast are reading, they both become more empathetic together. They step into the minds of fictional characters and connect with them, which also makes them better at understanding and empathizing with each other and themselves. Reading helps the Beast to step out of his own troubled mind, experiencing the thoughts and emotions of other people, which in turn helps him understand his own thoughts and emotions, and of course, the emotions of Belle. And this is reflected in his exclamatory song in which he reflects how he knows now that she'd never leave him even after she runs away, and how he'll always feel connected and remember her for years as he wastes away in his tower, how he'll always see her when he closes his eyes. Beauty and the Beast teaches us the importance of relationships and how we need others to help us to like ourselves, and that we need help from the people in our life to overcome mental roadblocks such as self-esteem and social anxiety. It also tells us how reading can improve our self-awareness and emotional intelligence, how reading makes us more understanding. Though it's teaching to value the inside of people instead of only the appearance is ultimately, it's been the message of Beauty and the Beast for thousands of years.